time. So welcome everybody to this session on pre-registration and also the uptake of pre-registration uh, in a couple of fields. So I'm super glad to have um, three experts on pre-registration here with me. And um, that um, and Celine Heinel, particularly since she organized it, that we can do this symposium here. And um, thanks so much, Celine, for um, handing in the abstracts and everything else. So this is not my doing. Um, I'm just um, a bit of the MC tonight, um, to, or at least for me, it's tonight. So shout out to everybody else where this is a bit earlier, also in the day, and also for to the Australians, where this is presumably even later than for me tonight. Okay, so we're going to talk about pre-registration and um, the uptake of pre-registration in um, several fields. So we have, uh, we're starting off with um, medical sciences and uh, here in particular clinical trials and I'm happy to have Nick Vito here um, who will um, talk about um, this uptake and uh, then Marianne Bakke, she will uh, talk about uh, psychology in particularly, how pre-registrations has um, evolved in this field. And I think she will tell us a lot about this because uh, psychology is, as we know, one of the fields where pre-registration has been picked up quite with quite some success. Uh, then Celine Heinel um, from uh, the Institute for Risk Assessment in Germany, she will speak about um, uh, preclinical research, uh, in particular in vivo studies, so animal studies, and um, talk a bit also about the registry uh, that they have, um, I think now for two years, uh, two and a half years, uh, she'll tell you a bit more in detail. And um, I will only very, very briefly um, share some thoughts on pre-registration in in vitro research about uh, the challenges we face here because um, I can't talk about the uptake and you'll see why in um, uh, in a couple of minutes. So uh, we thought the session would be organized very well um, if we all give a five minute introduction only. And then, then we will discuss between the um, four of us a couple of challenges that we see and a couple of questions that we uh, think are important. So um, I will moderate this. And after answering one or two questions that we think are important, we have a little poll. Um, and this poll I will display after this. And all the people here um, watching this, um, you can then decide what would be a good idea for us to talk about. And of course, you can also post your questions into the questions and answers. Yeah, so here in Zoom, there is not only the chat, but also the questions and answers. I was confused of this also when I entered this conference. I didn't know about this. And in the questions and answers, you can even upvote questions and answers. So if somebody asks a question and a lot of people vote it up, you can be sure that I will um, hand over this question uh, to the other three panelists. And uh, we will try also to answer your question. Okay. And uh, with that, I give to uh, Nick, who will start off with pre-registration in uh, clinical trials and give a short introduction. Nick. Nick, you're still muted. Okay, can everyone see my slide? Yes, excellent. Yes. Great. So um, yeah, hi everyone, Nick DeVito. I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford and I study clinical trial registration and reporting. And I just wanted to give a quick background on clinical trial registration and reporting um, for people who might not be familiar and sort of to form some of the discussion we're going to have. So um, starting briefly with the motivation of uh, how clinical trial registries came about. Um, so in the late 80s, Robert John Sands wrote this piece that's often cited as sort of foundational to the argument as to why we needed comprehensive global trial registration. He um, framed it in uh, a way to prevent publication bias, right? Sands was... Um, you know, part of this evidence-based medicine movement that was emerging very much in the late 80s and the early 90s. And it should be no surprise that the call for registries sort of grew alongside that movement. Um, he wanted to know what studies were being conducted so that he could um, better generate and uh, identify bias, generate evidence and identify biases in the literature to uh, about treatment effects mainly. And he showed using a proto-cancer registry at the time that had results compared to the published literature, sort of what that looked like. 
Um, he, he showed real examples of publication bias. So that was one big motivation. And then the other, which I think is a bit more unique to clinical, um, to the clinical sphere is recruitment. People wanted a way to connect potential uh, patients to studies in which they could participate. And um, I'd argue that like that, because it, it's not like psychology or economics where you have um, undergrads, you can pay $10 an hour to come participate in your studies, right? You need people who have the conditions, there's harms involved, there's risks involved that aren't there for lots of other types of research. And I would argue that clinicaltrials.gov to this day, right? When you go there, this is the front page. Um, and it is geared towards finding on studies that are recruiting for conditions and locations, right? That's very much geared towards participant matching. Um, and of course, so there's a glo there's this global um, network of registries in, in now under the guise of the International Clinical Trial Registration Platform, which is hosted in the WHO. They set standards for registries and all these registries participate of which clinicaltrials.gov is the largest by far and oldest. So um, we don't, won't cover all of these things. This is merely for demonstration purposes, but these are some main events that like led to registration um, in the clinical field. And um, there were, you know, we can group these into regulatory and legal um, milestones, sort of statements from national and multinational bodies promoting registration, uh, how to do it, when to do it, why to do it, and the ethical imperative to do it. Um, you had academics who were creating these statements to incorporate it into the way we report research. And you had industry um, eventually coming on board to support it as well, kicking and screaming, but eventually becoming um, you know, full participants in it and uh, pretty good at it, which is what a lot of my research covers. You can be slightly more reductivist though and say we had years of tireless advocacy and groundwork leading up to 2004, which was sort of the turning point for registration. Um, people like Kay Dickerson, Ian Chalmers, um, Dickerson Rennie, these are people who, be, who were beating the drum for years to promote registration. And then you had a big scandal, sort of an inciting incident for a whole bunch of action. And that was the paroxetine scandal. If uh, people are familiar with that, um, if you're not very, very briefly, it was an anti, it's an antidepressant that um, GSK put on the market, and uh, they withheld and misrepresented evidence that showed that it actually increased the risk of suicide when given to um, children and adolescents, and it caused a huge storm. It led to the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors to release their statement requiring prospective registration, which was huge. Uh, that is the biggest thing by far to ever happen to the field of registration in clinical trials outside of maybe the finding, founding of clinicaltrials.gov. You can see 2004 that just shoots up upwards. Um, not all of these are prospective. At last check, you know, trials covered under the US law, the FDA Amendments Act, which actually doesn't require prospective registration, it requires registration within 21 days. About 80% of about 28,000 trials meet that standard, but uh, about 88% meet that standard, about 80% are pre-registered. So just some closing thoughts as we, um, to set the stage for what we're doing. I think there's a lot of unique and not unique things about the clinical landscape. The motivations are a little bit different. As I went over, you have this high level stakeholder buy-in that other areas I don't think have seen to the extent we have in clinical research. We have laws and regulations, which is something that are very difficult to do in other areas because human health and wellness is not sort of impacted and there's not an entire industry built up around it. But um, we have a lot of the same issues around using these to promote rigor and around the people complaining about the effort to do so. The infrastructure exists for clinical research. We have our own infrastructure, but the OSF is an infrastructure for everyone else. And um, we have inciting incidents, big scandals in these areas, and we have plenty of staunch advocates uh, on both sides. And uh, that is it for my introduction to clinical research. Yes, excellent. Thank you so much, Nick. So you we're talking about infrastructure. I think that's something that we'll definitely go back to in the discussion, what kind of roles infrastructures play and um, and how they differ also across the different fields. So next up is uh, Marianne, and uh, she'll talk about psychology. Uh, yeah. I'll also start sharing my screen.
Yeah, so uh, I will talk about pre-registration in psychology. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, in psychology, it's uh, somewhat less recent, although we're, uh, I think also, uh, yeah, uh, 10 years ago, I think it's, it's almost, um, yeah, it, it was probably around this time, 10 years ago, um, I think some turbulent times in psychology started. Uh, so one of these things was that we had uh, this uh, major fraud case uh, of Diederik Stapel, um, but also some other things happened around the same time. So uh, we had this paper by Daryl Bem that was published in a high impact journal in which he proved that precognition was real. And he did so by nine studies or something that all showed a significant effect. Um, and of course, we know that that cannot be true. So it should be a null effect. But how is it possible to get that published with so many significant studies? And what does that say about other studies that are published? Um, and also around the same time, we had uh, some uh, big uh, field replication studies. Um, and uh, of course, later on, we even found more and more uh, field replication. So that made that, um, yeah, uh, a lot of people realized that something was not going well in psychology. And um, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, for a lot of researchers felt it that way. And basically, yeah, what, what the conclusion was is that we have all those decisions that we are making when we are analyzing or studies um and uh yeah if you combine these different things then it's quite easy to find a significant effect although it's not probably there um and then you can just build up a nice story around it and publish it or if it's really not working then uh you can put it in your file drawer and so we end up with all those studies that uh probably are uh, for a large part no effects um and i think this was uh yeah because of all those different things that, that uh, went wrong or raised some red flags in psychology, a lot of people realized that. And also one of the uh, main proposed solutions uh, at that time was uh, to do pre-registration. Because in that way, you can then, uh, before you uh, start analyzing your data, you can decide on uh, what you're going to do. So you have your analysis plan and everything ready. Uh, so I think it's, a little bit more also focused on um, uh, preventing this p hacking or the use of questionable research practices and a little bit less on the uh, uh, publication bias, uh, the prevention of that. Um, and um, also because a lot of researchers realized that something went wrong um, and, and they started connecting with each other. Um, and, and that also led, for example, to the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science, which is a really action-oriented society. And that also resulted in things like uh, different formats uh, for different research designs. So a pre-registration formats for different types of research. So um, we have um, many different formats from very extensive ones to less, uh, more simple one. Uh, and for uh, specific things like qualitative research, secondary data, cognitive modeling, and all those things are possible also, of course, because we have the open science framework, which was also developed around uh, uh, the same time. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of uh, work also from researchers in that. So um, uh, uh, many of these formats are also developed, for example, during meetings of the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science. So a lot of uh, yeah, bottom up um, work from researchers uh, helped to get this pre-registration uh, from the ground. Uh, but also some other things, of course. So um, we had a, a pre-registration challenge also to increase this uptake of pre-registration. So uh, for the first thousand uh, researchers who uh, pre-registered their study and got it published in uh, some uh, journal, um, they got a thousand dollar each. Um, uh, there are now uh, many journals who award pre-registration badges. Um, so that might also um, uh, and yeah, help people to uh, to do these kind of things. And what we see is that there are now a lot of 
uh, registrations. Uh, so I think now at the OSF, there are uh, even more than 77,000 registrations. Um, and uh, also um, uh, uh, the Chris Chambers um, and others, they, uh, they uh, promoted a registered reports. So uh, these are comparable to uh, pre-registrations, but then they're also peer reviewed um, before collecting the data and uh, you will get a publication independent of uh, your results. Uh, yeah, you should just follow your pre-specified plan and then you will have this uh, publication. And that's now also offered by uh, many different journals. Um, and also now uh, we see more and more research, which also shows sometimes that, that there are also definitely things that need to be improved or that are not optimal yet. Uh, so I definitely don't think that we are here also because uh, although pre-registration um, has become more and more, uh, uh, it's being done more and more, it's of course still only a small part of all uh, psychological research that's now uh, pre-registered. Um, but this research, for example, uh, showed that uh, um, uh, the specificity of pre-registrations could definitely be improved. Also the adherence to pre-registered plans is not always uh, uh, good or uh, deviations are not transparently uh, reported, um, uh, but also that it's uh, often uh, well valued, uh, the research quality. Um, so we see more and more research also uh, popping up into uh, this, which is uh, really nice. So um, yeah, I think that was what I wanted to say and um, other things will uh, pop up during the discussion. Yes, thank you so much. And um, after psychology, we now are heading back into more biomedical fields. So um, Celine will report now on in vivo, particular animal studies. Just a second. Uh, yes, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, perfect. So I'm happy to be part of the session, I have to say, because I think, um, yeah, I will introduce preclinical research and we are really lagging behind. So I think we can learn a lot from, from other fields. So, um, but I will shortly introduce um, uh, preclinical research and the background, um, why it's done. So um, similar to psychology and uh, what Marian already said is, um, we are we're also facing a strong reproducibility crisis within the biomedical sciences. And in addition to this, we also, what, what was observed already long time ago is that there's an insufficient translation from biomedical research into clinical science. Here's just one example, meta-analysis from stroke research, where um, they looked at treatment effects in experimental animal, animal studies and um, up to uh, phase three clinical trials, and they see a strong decrease in the rate of uh, efficient um, uh, effects in, of treatment uh, for acute stroke. So we can see this across all kinds of biomedical research fields. And of course, this has a lot of different uh, underlying reasons, so quality of research, but also things which can be addressed by pre-registration, like uh, selective reporting, questionable research practices. And what I also want to add that this, of course, represents also an ethical issue if patients are really put at risk by being recruited in clinical trials and um, only based on, on, I would say, fragile results from, uh, from experimental studies. But there's another ethical issue which is often forgotten is that most of the uh, preclinical research is still based on animal research and animal experiments, which are still very controversial in our society. And we know already since long time, and now there are really recent studies which show also the dimension of the problem and how many animal experiments are actually performed without uh, contributing to any gain of knowledge and scientific progress. Um, so here, to, I, I won't go into detail, just to quickly uh, uh, put some numbers on it, is uh, here two studies which looked at uh, publication rates from animal study protocols. So this is how uh, every scientist in Europe which want to perform an animal experiments had to get a permission uh, by applying with an animal study protocol. And they looked how many of these protocols led to at least one publication in the end. 
And the number in Germany, which they found was 67%, and something similar also in the Netherlands. After seven years of the study protocol uh, permission, there were uh, only a publication rate of 60%. And if they looked at individual numbers of animals, so the, the numbers which were planned, the animals which were planned, which one were reported in the final publications, these were only 26%. So we don't know exactly the number, but we know that a huge amount of animal experiments are conducted without uh, contributing to any knowledge and this was also one one motivation I think to or is one motivation to start pre-registering animal experiments so um, already uh, yeah now 10 years ago there were there were voices which were raised and uh, saying okay we could perhaps also pre-register preclinical research on the, on the example also of uh, clinical research and if this would make sense but it's only until 2018 where there was a first uh, preclinical uh, re pre-registration platform for preclinical research, uh, preclinicaltrials.eu, an initiative by the Utrecht University. So pre-registration spe specific to animal in vivo research. And then in 2019, we followed with uh, our pre-registration platform, animalstudyregistry.org, so hosted by the uh, Federal Institute for Risk Assessment, so it's a gov governmental initiative. And uh, both platforms um, aim the same, so uh, uh, aim for pre-registration and preclinical research and offer a template also with uh, a guided template to support scientists in designing their study and uh, what they have to report. And of course, uh, there's also the possibility to pre-register on the open science framework. So a registry which is open to all kinds of research and of course also animal research can be there. But for the shortness of time, I would just uh, focus a little bit to show the number and the state of pre-registration in preclinical research on these both registries. And so uh, perfectly on time for our uh, session today, the preclinical trial uh, preclinicaltrials.eu uh, published one week ago a uh, nice evaluation paper on uh, on the preclinicaltrials.eu um, so the experiences and um, so I took these numbers and added just our numbers to show a little bit how uh, actually little is the pre-registration uptake still in preclinical research so we only have 171 pre-registrations both registries combined and most are still in the embargo and also, I mean, we're open to all countries over the world and we see that there's uh, an uptake in all countries. But what we also see is that we are still also working in our our little uh, hosting countries still. So um, we are more uh, taking up in Germany and the others in Netherlands. So um, we still have work to do to get it to get a broad uptake. And um, so we talk to stakeholders to really also create incentives, but we also talk to scientists because I think the main problem in biomedical research is still that it's unknown by most scientists. They're simply not aware of the uh, possibility to pre-register. And the ones they know, they often also wait for a change of the system. But I think we should take perhaps example on, on psychology and really try to get a bottom-up movement uh, started so they can still already pre-register and make this visible. So in, um, and by uh, putting it into their publication or their um, uh, applications for funding. And uh, with this, I would like to end. And perhaps just if you're interested, also invite you to have a look at our website, animalstudyregistry.org. And um, um, you can screen to re uh, through the studies without creating any account. And with this, I would like to stop. Thank you. And uh, give to Ulf, back to Ulf. Yes, thank you so much, Celine. Um, yes, this is a um, this including the uh, the Dutch side. So perhaps not all of you are aware of these. So in the Netherlands, it's uh, preclinicaltrials.eu, and um, of course. also um, also. But we'll talk about this later because there are now two platforms, and we saw this in the talk by Nick as well. Um, the the many platforms that uh, that came up to to suddenly register clinical trials, and Mayan also had an overview of what kind of um, options you have to register your study and um, the simplest one perhaps as predicted.com and we'll certainly talk about this um, uh, later on but now I will uh, very briefly um, uh, look at um, um, look at um, pre-registration in um, let me briefly start this um, pre-registration in 
uh, in in vitro research. So as I already said before, um, uh, there's not much going on in in vitro research. And um, there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, and it starts with this. So this is a typical in vitro paper. So what you can see here, it's highly relevant. It's looking at the infection um, of human neural progenitor cells in and brain organoids by SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1. And as you can see here in the upper panel, if you are a bit familiar with this, there is apparently an infection going on with SARS-CoV-2, but not with SARS-CoV-1. So apparently these um, uh, these models are highly relevant to understanding the, um, the disease and progression of disease, because as you know, SARS-CoV-2 has surprised us with um, loss of, uh, loss of um, taste and smell. And um, this apparently in this model um, is, um, is investigated. So, but now imagine pre-registering such a study. Yeah, so you have a lot of histology here. You have a lot of graphs that uh, show some kind of pl plug assay looking at um, how um, the growth of, vi of the virus in, in the organoids and so forth. It's highly relevant, but still, how will you pre-register it? Perhaps this first hypothesis here, up here, you will perhaps be able to pre-register. But um, the question now is, how will you go about and, and continue, particularly, and here's another example, with the advent of single cell um, uh, RNA sequencing, how will you pre-register um, your thoughts about such results? So here, um, uh, people, um, are creating organoids that are apparently hard forming and it's about the development of these organoids. And uh, they do single cell sequencing uh, to show that uh, they recapitulate um, early on um, for gut development. So um, they have a hypothesis that something should be going on in these, in these organoids um, and they could have pre-registered it, but how could they quantitatively say, okay, this is going on in these kind of cell types here that you all see. We expect um, a certain, it's not cell types, but certain genes that are upregulated um, uh, in, these, uh, in these cells. And you see um, they're, they're doing this single cell sequencing. And the question really is how much of this does need to be pre-registered? And, um, and as we can see, there are many challenges here in pre-registration of in vitro studies. So we have a plethora of laboratory techniques. So we have semi-quantitative ones, Western blots, histochemistry. We have quantitative ones with qPCR or aqua measuring proteins. Then we have very complex ones, proteomics, single cell RNA sequencing, all the, the whole toolbox of the wet lab is there. And you don't even, like animal experiments, need to pre-register them. Perhaps you need some kind of ethical approval because you're using um, human donors as um, to create your um, iPSCs, but that's everything that, you, that you'll need to do. So you don't even need an animal permit uh, where you state what you're going to do with the animals, but you just have iPSCs and with these iPSCs, you can basically do everything that you want. So, and the challenges that I see here is, of course, that we have uh, what kind of predictions will we make? Yeah, what kind of are core predictions and do we want to predict everything that we do? And we sometimes have this in animal experiments as well, that we don't know exactly what kind of researcher degrees of freedom do we really have? Because it's not only researcher degrees of freedom in analysis, but it's also in techniques. So if you ran a qPCR on a certain cell type and there's this result um, does not well, it well, is not um, fit for the narrative that you have. Do you report it or not? So we have strong problems here with reporting issues. And uh, is pre-registration pre a way out of here, out of this in the um, in vitro studies? Then it's about the knowledge claim. So what are we claiming really in in vitro research that is helping us? Because it's not like in psychology or in evolutionary theory where you have an actual theory, what is going on. And from this theory, you derive um, what you expect. In animal research and also in, um, in in vitro research, you very often have just a rough idea what the, um, what the uh, disease is about. Think of Alzheimer's, uh, think of uh, stroke. We would very know well how stroke um, uh, comes about, but when it comes to the nitty gritty details of the mechanisms, um, it's a sound theory um, that makes us, that helps us develop um, viable drugs is still missing. Um, then 
at the core, I think, is the description of the methods and protocols. Uh, so methods and protocols are even more important than in psychology, because here, um, you already see in the next line, IP, so intellectual property, is um, something where a lot of researchers say, ah, oh, this is something that I want to guard. Yeah, so some researchers, and this is only if you talk to them privately, say, well, we are omitting parts from the methods and results section on purpose. Um, so that nobody can um, recreate our organoid because we think this is a business model, but we need to publish it first. And then we have methods and analyses. Um, I mean, a lot of psychologists are really, really good at, uh, at quantitative methods. Um, the wet lab researchers, well, I don't speak for all of them, but there is at least some kind of room for improvement. Yeah? So confusions of biological units versus experimental units versus technical replicates. It's, um, it's very hard sometimes even to distinguish those. And if they cannot even distinguish those in a paper, how will they distinguish those in a pre-registration? So I can only point you to one of the projects that we're currently doing. So it's um, situated at the Einstein Center for 3 R. So we're also trying to reduce um, animal experiments and we have a project there that uh, is adding to the three R's, three additional R's, the robustness registration and reporting of three R projects. So we're working with five to six um, organoid projects, organ on a chip projects to talk to the community what do they think should be registered for the experiments and what are viable ways to do this. Is really a platform um, something that they should use or is an electronic lab notebook something um, that would be a lot easier for them to use um, to pre-register their experiments or register them at least in a larger community and make them available to reviewers. And I think we're going to talk a bit more about these problems that um, also apply to in vitro research um, to um, other um, uh, to these other fields. Okay, and with that, I think we're finished with our um, presentation. So I'm going to stop presenting. Oh, how do I do this? Stop presenting. Mm. Have I stopped presenting already? No. No, no. There should be a little green bar up at the top of your screen, perhaps. Yeah. I ah, hear stop. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks so much, Nick. So uh, apparently. Okay. Good. So um, I see there are already some questions and answer. So some questions. So you can vote for these questions already. So um, some people. So just uh, vote them up. There's a little thumb up there. And if you give these questions a thumb up, I will ask them later. But just as a um, um, just as a warm up question, yeah, I want to give um, to the round is um, so. Um, what kind of concrete measures like in your field that you've seen have really made the difference for um, people to take up pre-registration? And I would just want to ask Nick first um, because you already hinted at some of those. So what kind of concrete measures have really pushed it and um, have pushed your field into taking up pre-registration? Yeah, sure. I really do think that the most important one, as I, like I, you said, I hinted at briefly in my presentation was the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, which is the top, your JAMAs, your Lancets, your NEGMs, your, your very top, top um, journals in the medical field um, put, put out a policy that many other journals in the field adopt. And they said, we will not publish your clinical trial uh, starting next year unless it has a prospectively prospective registration in a recognized clinical trial registry. And mm -hmm. Like I said, you saw you saw my chart that led to a, I think it was that and pretty much only that that led to a skyrocketing because you have this infrastructure, you had clinical trials and dot gov in place, and you even had a registration requirement from the FDA Modernization Act um, from the late 90s, but uptake was very slow and there was no real enforcement. And it wasn't until there were stakes for people who want their trials to be um, published that it really, really took off. And then um, with the timing of it, with the paroxetine, all this other infrastructure, then very quickly registries in other places came about as well, and all these um, supporting efforts sort of built off of that. But um, I think that ICMJE can't be understated how important that was to, to the process. Yeah, and uh, Marian, I think psychologists are very fond of badges, but there's am <laughs> ambiguous evidence about that about the badges. So tell us, what, what, what is this in your field? 
Yeah, yeah. So I think, of course, we are missing this kind of enforcement, like uh, what uh, Nick is telling uh, telling about that that we should should use it. So, uh, but I think so, and, and therefore it's also on, on much lower levels, uh, of course, the uptake than uh, than for clinical trials. Uh, but um, yeah, I think for us the most important. Uh, steps first was to uh, create the opportunities to uh, to do it. So having the open science framework there, having different templates to do it, having a lot of papers that uh, showed you how to do it in an easy way, um, uh, having this community of people that talk to each other and and try to really promote that. And I think that set this uh, this 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 first step. And uh, maybe the batches also helped and these things. But uh, yeah, it, it might be even more important to first have the infrastructure and get it known everywhere. And then uh, yeah, and then we probably need now somewhat more enforcement as well to uh, to get it even at higher levels. Yes, uh, speaking of the infrastructure, I want to, um, because Celine, I'm skipping you here, because I, fr from your one I of your slides, the point. <laughs> I, I think the uptake yeah. is, is not so big, as I said, in, in vitro research, yeah. um, and we come to the questions that you <laughs> saw, they're really good questions already in the chat, but Celine, um, now you have two platforms in, um, in Europe, at least, um, or two platforms for registering these animal experiments, and Mayan also hinted at, and Nick showed that um, these platforms are now kind of taken together by a, by a larger consortium. Do you think this would help? Um, because sometimes people, either they don't know it and then they even have a choice and don't know which one is the best. Of course, you'd say the, 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 um, your platform has some advantages, but what do you think? What, how should this be done in the future? Do you think there will be some kind of merging of platforms and infrastructures? Yeah, of course, it's, that's a good question. Yes, we're at the moment two platforms, but I think um, like for the other field, this is not actually a problem, but of course we need to bundle the information. I think it's good to have different pl platforms and different options so scientists can choose also. And I think having just one platform puts a lot of complicated question like who should host it, uh, where should it be hosted? And, and it's a lot of also responsibility for, for, for one organization in the end. But I think bundling the information, so just um, having, having a, a platform which just um, uh, makes it findable and searchable, so one common platform for this or, or also several ones, but which really bundle the information from the different registries will be important if we want to make pre-registration then really usable. So um, I agree that it's difficult to look at different platforms, especially if at the beginning we just have so few pre-registrations and uh, for your research questions, you won't go to uh, every platform. And I think for the future, it would be important to bundle the information, but still having several platforms, I think is actually good to have this choice. Yeah, and I think at a, as a, at a conference like this, where a lot of meta researchers are here, all the meta researchers <laughs> will be very, very glad if they don't have to search through all the databases. Of course. I mean, Nick, in, in the old trials, you, you, had to, you had to look through all the databases, or how did you do this then? Or Yeah, I have um, written many a scraper to scrape data off of clinical trial registries because there's so many. But what's nice too, and as you know, these standards proliferate and different registries proliferate across different fields and if you get competing i say competing they don't really care where you register and often that decision is made for you in the regulatory schema um, but the 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 important part is that you have the ictrp which is sort of this overarching body that imposes a minimum standard on them of what registration should entail so you can guarantee or at least you should be able to guarantee whether you can is a different question but you should be able to guarantee that a minimum set of information about that trial will be available no matter which registry you go to. Now, like the provision of that data and the quality of it will vary considerably. But hypothetically, these like 21 fields, I think it is, or something like that, should be present on every registry. You have that at least standardization and some registries go above and beyond that. But I think that's a big, um, something to keep in mind as you, know, you think about a proliferation of standards across um, a field. Yes, Celine, very briefly responding to this. Yeah, that we're working with the other registries to define minimal standards at the moment. I think that's very yeah. important. You're absolutely right. So that people can refer to if they want to recommend pre-registration. Yeah, and now we're at the first step. So um, you all show that there are platforms. So 
people can register. This is the first step. But now the question is, what should they register? And I would um, refer here to a um, uh, to a question by Olavo. So um, we had to. So we apparently divided here between in vivo and in vitro research. Uh, yes, um, we did, but of course a bit on purpose. Um, and you already, of course, Olavo, we know each other. You already. Um, graphs uh, that uh, there's more to it. You asked, um, there's the, isn't the important division to be drawn between exploratory research where multiple outcomes and degrees of freedom and analysis are desirable and confirmatory research where we are looking to restrict them. Now, of course, in vitro research will tend more to the exploratory side, but there might be cases which we will have to truly confirmatory experiment. So, but before we go in this in vitro, I think this is also a very, um, what can we learn from psychology here? Because I mean, clinical trials are clearly super confirmatory, Nick. I mean, this is, this is without doubt, but in psychology, we have the same thing. Um, what can we learn from psychology there? What can the basic biomedical sciences learn from psychology for this distinction? And where would you cut, cut this off, Mayan? Yeah, yeah, I think this is a really good and important question. And um, I think what, uh, yeah, what, what one of the problems, at least in psychology is, is that we have uh, a lot of research that is basically exploratory, well, we present it as confirm confirmatory. So it's also with how you report your results in a paper, of course, and we are really, um, a lot of these psychology papers still follow this format of research question, hypothesis, methods, uh, and so on, and so on. So it's, it's really in this uh, confirmatory format. And, um, and I think uh, by doing these pre-registrations, it, it makes this uh, much more explicit, um, this distinction, because then you know at least that these pre-registered studies are confirmatory. And also within studies, you can then also um, much better distinguish the uh, confirmatory parts with the exploratory parts. So what you see often is uh, quite a lot of, uh, or, uh, even in, within pre-registration, also an exploratory part, because of course, if you have the data there, then it's also too good to look into um, subgroup analysis or um, yeah, some other things um, and also report that. But then it's it's really clear, uh, this distinction. And um, I think that that's that's really helpful. So I, I can uh, imagine that that in 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 uh, th these other research fields, it, it might also be good to uh, maybe um, pre-register some part, the 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 really uh, confirmatory part, but of course also do all the other more exploratory parts. Yes. Yeah, so. Um... A, a question, so Nick, so if I look at clinical trials registries, um, and if I look at, psycholog at psychology, at their pre-registrations, and I haven't looked, of course, of course at all 77,000 pre-registrations, but sometimes it feels like it's even larger than the whole paper, this, these pre-registrations. They are really like, you can read, 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 read the whole afternoon, only pre-registrations. But in clinical trials, people have decided for a different route to, to do this, Nick. Yeah, so I think that's, yeah, that's an interesting distinction because in clinical trial registries, they all have sort of gone this tabular format. They go, you know, you're not so much specifying your hypothesis, you're specifying your outcomes, which infer a hypothesis, but you're not quite being as direct, right? And you, um, and you specify basic design information, but you don't get in the weeds. But I think a lot of that probably comes from the fact that the vast majority of clinical trials are going to have a behind the scenes protocol, a very, very detailed protocol as well. And we're starting to see movements um, in which um, re regulators want you to share those as part of your clinical trial registration. So under the FDA Amendment Act, if you're covered under that law, when you report your results, they also want a copy of your statistical analysis plan and your protocol to be uploaded alongside them. And people are doing that. It's incredibly like 90% of all trials I examined um, do that. And I think similar discussions are happening right now in the EU to uh, about what extent and when uh, potential protocols could be shared. So I think while when you're uploading to the OSF, you're uploading your protocol essentially, that is your, your pre-registration. So I think that's the distinction there. It's just these develop this sort of a tabular format, but you have that other piece that's still there, but it's a big movement to make that public earlier and earlier as well. Uh, it's sort of a separate part of the pre-registration conversation. Yeah, and I want to pick up here then um, 
uh, on uh, Michael's um, uh, question. So he thinks that it's uh, time for enforcing the pre-registration of animal studies by rule and law. And um, uh, well, I mean, we already, at least in the EU, we have a law on this, that everything has to be pre-registered um, in, in animal studies because you, you need to file in your animal study with a regulatory authority, but, um, but it's then not, not so open for everybody else. So Celine, do you think we should really have a mandatory pre-registration? And also now connecting this, if this becomes mandatory, what would be your minimum requirement? What would you have in there? in these, um, because your, your pre-registrations are already really, really extensive. So if you have to fill this out, it takes some time. So Sabine. Yeah, that's of course a, compli a difficult question, but we often uh, get get this one because they're always, they're the extreme, the ones who don't want to do, uh, to pre-register at all and the ones who want to enforce it immediately. But I think if we would enforce it now where it's not even known by most of the scientists and if we would be too early on this, then we would really, the, the scientists would more react, uh, be yeah, reluctant perhaps even and, and just really meet the minimum requirements to just yeah get the regulation done. But I think, I mean, Marian has some really nice work on how the quality of pre-registration really also makes a difference and really can increase the efficiency of uh, pre-registration. And that's why I think if we would just enforce it now, it would not, uh, it, it would not have the long-term effect of really improving science because scientists would not be so willing to, to really start that's at least what I, I believe. But if we would <laughs> do it mandatory, so what you're saying, I think, um, I mean, uh, I think in psychology, it's it's a lot about statistics and about really preventing questionable research practices and, and about uh, making making really claims uh, which are robust uh, statistically. But I think in, in biomedical research, we would also, what would be important is just to have uh, have studies which leave a trace so so really just say okay there were some experiments and that's why if it would be mandatory it would probably be also already a step to to just know that there are some uh, treatments tested and then perhaps um not make it as extensive but i think the the since most of the the, the research is still exploratory also, the whole statistical part is still difficult for, for a lot of scientists and might still be a, a barrier. So we are happy. I mean, we have an extensive template, but we, it's, it's, uh, you're free to, to fill in whatever you want. So if you have an exploratory, uh, exploratory study, you can just say, okay, I'm testing, I don't know, um, opioids in, in mice, and you don't need to, to put a whole, uh, a whole statistical plan, but then it's at least it's transparent that it was just an exploration. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and then if we, even if this is not mandatory, I mean, um, we have now pre-registrations, even though if we only have 50. So Marian, I think this is also part of your research about the quality. And um, I see that um, some, um, uh, some people who are attending this here are really interested in this. Um, so how we, I as a reviewer, I'm already, I'm, I'm really um, overburdened even with the review process. I mean, um, I, wanna, I wanna do this uh, very, very, uh, I, I want to do this nicely for the, for the people who wrote the paper, but also be critical about it. And then I even have to go back to the, to the pre-registration. And I remember a lot of um, conversations with Tom Hartwig, for example, also on this. So how can we um, take away this burden also from the reviewers. I mean, currently during the pandemic, it's even hard to find reviewers for your papers and then they have to look at the pre-registration to check this. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, uh, that, that, that's definitely, uh, definitely something. Um, so uh, um, uh, it, 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 it's, it can be indeed quite lengthy uh, pre-registrations and, um, uh, and 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 that's that might give some burden also to the reviewers. 
Uh, and then I, I've read also a lot of free registrations and they're also not always as, as good as you hope that they are. So even if they are there, then it's often not really clear what they what they mean and, and which uh, variable they refer to. Um, so, uh, yeah, one thing is that I hope that if, if this, this the quality improves or that we are better trained in, in doing that, that the pre registrations are also better readable and maybe uh, there could also be clear connections between the paper and a pre-registration. I mean, uh, yeah, we can also you do uh, different types of papers, of course, in which these connections are are, are made um, more transparent between the the, the pre-registered parts and the paper parts, so that it's kind of more an an, 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 an yeah a, a, a nice and clear <laughs> way, uh, yeah, that we could also make it easier for the reviewers, but. Yeah, these are really steps that we still need to take. And um, yeah, right now it's it's uh, it, it, it might ask a little bit more from the from the reviewer. On the other hand, uh, you could really start with this uh, pre-registration, and if you see that something is going wrong there, then then you already know that that's uh, yeah you can stop <laughs> maybe your review and just give that back to the editor because yeah that's that's of course a, a major issue. So, mm -hmm. and Nick. You want to reply to this? Yeah, I just wanted to say I think this is a natural place for to talk about registered reports a very little bit, and then how I and how I think that that is a, um, a an area where clinical trials and are going to lag far behind the field. Um, when you have people like Chris Chambers out there really promoting this in other areas, and while uptake is I think relatively slow, it is happening and it's out there. But um, I think clinical Clinical research is going to be very resistant to this as a as a thing where and where um, you know you're getting your protocol reviewed and in an acceptance because the journals aren't interested. If if someone bumps into David Meller, they can ask how um, the hackathon to send emails to all the medical journals went to try to get them to adopt registered reports. But the couple emails I sent as part of that, they both the, they got back in touch and said, we're not, we're just not interested in this right now. So that's an interesting area where I think clinical medicine really might lag behind some other areas and where um, rigor and pre-registration could start to like eclipse it in other areas if you start to see increased uptake elsewhere. Yeah, and um, follow up question. Um, I see there are a couple of more questions in the in the Q&A and I'll come back to them. We have eight minutes, so very brief question to Celine. So to to, so to enable people to do this properly, um, what is kind of your, what are the educational resources? Are there educational resources and, or do you plan to develop some? Because I know in psychology, there are some, but of course, this is not part of the, of the general curriculum for, for graduate students. And um, what are you doing in this respect? Because I'm very much interested in these educational issues. Celine. Uh, to, um, uh, at the moment, uh, not. We don't have any any uh, resources. I mean, we are going to to universities and uh, talking to scientists and also um, uh, um, presenting pre-registration there. And this is why I see that uh, most are still not aware of it. But of course, it would be interesting to. I mean, especially when I see the example of psychology to really address also early career researchers and to really uh, go there at an early time point. I think. I mean. We are planning a school together, no, <laughs> with where yeah. we also will. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put it, but, uh, next year, but yes. I don't have um, uh, uh, resources at the moment. We don't have, but it would be nice, of course, to to create some. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, and so um, there's one question to me um, by Anonymous. Um, so in the in vitro studies, um, how do you think registered reports would help? And I would take this as the um, like. Um, as a starting point, because there's this registered report thing, the pre-registration and Chris Chambers, he's certainly an advocate of these um, registered reports, which I think are very well suited for what Olavo told us uh, before for this very confirmatory research. Um, Mayan, in your field, is there any, when would you, uh, would, when would you decide to pre-register something? And then when would, would you decide to, um, to submit a registered report? Let's assume all journals, including Nature, have registered reports. Is there, yeah. is there some, some boundary that you would set? Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know. So um, yeah, registered reports are, of course, then, then um, 
uh, I think, uh, so what you see mostly in practice is that, uh, that, that people, um, maybe it's, it's an easier step to start with, with pre-registration in a way that it's, um, uh, you still can choose where to publish it, for example, or um, uh, um, you have more control over the, 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 the time of your project. Because, if, of course, if you do a registered report, then you uh, have to submit your plan and then it will be away for some time by some reviewers. So, um, uh, so I, I uh, noticed that, for example, that that for some PhD students or people that have a uh, limited time in a postdoc, that that could be uh, something. Uh, so, it, it in in that sense, it seems to be easier to first do a pre-registration uh, for people to do than uh, immediately start with a registered report. Uh, on the other hand, I think when you really have a nice, clear, uh, confirmatory study, so when when there is also a good uh, theoretical base or some earlier uh, evidence, then uh, then it's it's uh, probably the 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 um, a very good situation to to do this registered report. Um, but I don't know whether there yeah um, whether there are other very clear uh, distinctions in the 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 research or or the types of research or studies that you uh, could could do. Um, uh, although I think that pre-registration can be somewhat more flexible in a way that you can 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 do it for different types of studies and, and these kind of things. So it's it's I think it's somewhat more flexible and therefore maybe still more popular than, than registered reports. But I, I really uh, yeah would like to see more registered reports out there as well. Yeah. Yeah. I I want to um, as as the last question to all three of you. So there are two questions that kind of align a bit, and one is from Rose, and the other one is from Gilbert. Um, it's one is the social pressure that could be leveraged to um, let people um, have the pre-registration. Yes, you have to do this because it instills trust in your work. And Gilbert thinks it's it, there should even be an intrinsic motivation to do it because it's it's kind of good for yourself. I mean, Maya, and you are a psychologist, and um, I also did some work in, on in social psychology. So this may perhaps even work. It's better for your, it's better for yourself, because this is an intrinsic motivation to do it, because you're just doing better science. Do you think this will work? We'll start with Nick, then go to Celine, and then to the psychologist Mayan, who will wrap it up then, uh, whether this is possible. Short answers, please, because we only have three minutes left. Nick. Yeah, I, I personally, feel the intrinsic motivation should be a strong thing. That's that's what drives a lot of what I do. But um, I don't, I'm not confident it's enough for the entire field. And uh, Gilbert in another thing also mentioned gamification. And that's sort of something we've experimented with a bit too with our trials tracker project where, which is for reporting, not registration, but um, you know, gamifying and trying to get sponsors to care about how they rank compared to other sponsors and how well they're doing on, on, a, on a metric. Okay, Celine? Yeah, I also think uh, it should be enough, but I don't know if I trust the whole uh, community also uh, enough to do it, but I think uh, they first get to be aware uh, that this exists to, 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 get in, to, to develop the intrinsic motivation. And I also think that this is what Nick said with, this, uh, um, with, the, uh, with the gamification part would of course be perhaps interesting to test this and to, to uh, yeah, speak to the or to to elicit in, intrinsic motivation. Yeah, and now Marjan, and please uh, tell us also whether intrinsic motivation is still a thing in psychology or whether this has already <laughs> been replaced. Uh, I, I, I I'm not not so much into uh, real uh, psychology anymore for some time, but uh, I think uh, intrinsic motivation is really important. On the other hand, we have also a lot of other uh, motivations that are not intrinsic. So uh, of course we uh, have uh, publication pressure and all those other things, uh, which might put us. Uh, away from uh, the good science and as long as they don't match with each other so if we're not uh, awarded also for doing good science or get promoted by doing good science um, it, it will be really hard to only focus on the on the intrinsic motivation 
Yes, so thank you all three for contributing to a really nice discussion. Thank you for all those people attending and asking really interesting questions and apologies to all of you where we couldn't answer the questions. Um, there were so many important questions here already in the chat. We couldn't even bring up our poll because we had even more interesting questions there. But um, thank you so much all for joining and um, I wish you a nice um, follow up sessions to this conference. Thank you um, all three um, um, attendees here and um, from me i wish you a nice evening day or night wherever you are thank you very much bye bye thank you everyone thank you celine for organizing thank you, <laughs> thank, you. thank you bye 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 thanks very much to all our panelists that was a really fascinating talk and it just flew by the time um We'll be back in half an hour for the next session. In the meantime, please do go over to the Slack channel or the uh, Remo room for some uh, other gatherings and uh, see you again in half an hour. Thank I you. I could pop yes, to the Remo for a bit if anyone wants to follow up. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, I've just put the links in the chat for anybody who wants to, uh, to sign up if they're not already signed up. So thanks very much again. Hey, okay, cheers. Bye. bye. Thank you.